This is America on the Road, winner of the International Automotive Media Conference Gold Medal Award for Radio, and now in its 25th year on the air. Thanks for being with us as we bring you the latest automotive information from around the world. Now there's a new threat to the supply of vehicles that is driving new and used car prices up, and we'll tell you all about it. America on the Road is brought to you by Mercury Insurance and DrivingToday.com. If you're looking to save some money, you should switch to Mercury for your auto and home insurance. Californians save an average of $670 with Mercury, so imagine how much you could save. Get a quote today at mercuryinsurance.com. Hi, I'm Jack Red. With me is co-host Chris Teague, back with us, and we're so glad he's with us. He is based in Maine. I am based in Southern California. We write for a lot of automotive websites and cover cars for various people, including, of course, Driving Today, our uh, sister site here on, on uh, America on the Road. And I should welcome you, Chris. Welcome. Well, thank you for welcoming me, and uh, thanks, everybody, for listening. You know, we always go through the weather, Jack, and I would complain about the temperature, but I don't think I'm uh, the only one in the country that's very hot right now, so I'm going to avoid doing that. Well, I, you might think that it would be super hot where I live, but actually it is very pleasant. Uh, it's actually a bit cloudy today. It's probably going to go up to about maybe 72 degrees, which is why I live very close to the sand. <laughs> Because inland from here, my wife is actually in the desert right now, and it's probably going to be something close to 120 degrees in Palm Springs today, a little different than it is here in uh, the South Bay of uh, Southern California. So who knows, right? <laughs> Never know. You don't, but uh, it sounds like uh, you're going to have fairly good weather in Maine. I think summer in Maine would be terrific. I've got to believe that's the case. Hoping so. We're really looking forward to some outdoor activities and uh, some great vehicles to enjoy them with. Right. We're, of course, coming up on the 4th of July holiday, the Independence Day holiday, so that's a great one. Uh, this week, our special guest is Ford's Consumer Marketing Manager, Mark Gruber. I had a chance to sit down with him at the Ford Bronco Driving Experience in Austin recently. We're going to be talking with him about the 2021 Ford Bronco and what Ford is doing to ensure a, sex, a successful launch of that vehicle, a very important vehicle, of course, to them. It's not just a vehicle, it's really a brand that they're launching. Chris, tell us what you're going to be testing in the road test segment. I'm going to be talking about the 2021 GMC Sierra 1500 AT4. Wow, very nice. Full-size pickup truck with uh, some off-road uh, abilities. And, of course, I'm going to be talking about the 2021 Toyota Tacoma, which also has some off-road abilities, depending on how you equip it, so... Um, if you care about trucks, uh, we're your folks for that. Uh, before we do any of that, though, uh, let's talk a bit about what's going on automotive-wise. And we, we tease you a bit about what could threaten the, uh, the supply of automobiles coming up. Of course, there is a, a threat from the chip shortage. But another threat is cyber attackers and the lack of auto industry cybersecurity. Uh, this is a report from Automotive News by a cybersecurity's ratings provider called Black Kite. And they say that almost half of 100 automotive, automotive manufacturers and more than 17% of automotive suppliers are at high risk for ransomware and a ransomware attack. That doesn't sound very good, does it, Chris? It doesn't. And the scary thing for the automakers and really any company is that no matter how much great technology and equipment you have, uh, all it takes is one uneducated staff or employee uh, to, to kind of let someone into the back door. So um, very, very concerning stuff for them. Right. I mean, they are concerned that cyber attackers can infiltrate IT systems, install malware, and they can then hold uh, crucial data for ransom, which has happened a lot and probably a lot more than we know, because typically a company that is attacked in this way finds it's less expensive to pay the ransom than it is to do anything else about it. I mean, which is, is not particularly a good situation, right? I mean, these are essentially modern day pirates, aren't they? Yeah, and unfortunately, you know, the, the impact of spending the money in a preventative fashion uh, isn't so impactful, I guess, until it actually becomes a problem. So people tend to uh, apply medicine to the wound rather than to avoid the problem in the first place. Right. I'm sure a lot of the uh, manufacturers out there, and uh, for that matter, not just manufacturers, but uh, suppliers and dealers even, are using older servers, older equipment, uh, probably very vulnerable to ransomware. It's just a matter of, uh, you know, what, what do you do about that? And 
you know, I, I think in a lot of ways, this is uh, beyond crime. This is uh, this could be regarded as, as especially if some uh, bad actor, quote unquote, uh, attacks a major car company. I think it's a it's virtually an act of war against uh, the country, more so than it is just a, a crime against that particular company. What, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think it's a big deal, you know, especially given the not only the dollar amounts that are at stake, but, you know, the livelihoods of all the people that are involved and then, you know, the the technology that's there as well. But you mentioned suppliers and everything else, you know, it just reminded me of, of how scary that could actually be. You know, you look at a company like Ford or General Motors that have probably hundreds of suppliers, if not way more than that. And, you know, how do you ensure that all of them are on the same page with you and lockstep on information security? So, uh, a big deal, as you said, but it's also very, very scary, even with uh, all the protection measures put in place. Right. And uh, something needs to be done about this. I mean, what we have seen with the chip shortage, what that has done uh, to the supply of vehicles, it has had a, a very, very strong effect on the supply of vehicles and uh, send up car prices, both new and used car prices. So uh, like you say, this is a, a big, big deal. Well, something that might not be quite as big a deal, but kind of interesting, is the whole Carlos Ghosn saga. Uh, as you might remember, he is the former uh, Nissan head who escaped Japan after he was charged with crimes. I think he was charged with tax evasion, actually, uh, was the thing he was charged with, although uh, he was facing a prison term. He then escaped uh, with the help of a couple, uh, at least allegedly, with the help of a couple Green Berets, one of whom, Michael Taylor, uh, had been extradited to uh, Japan and is now sincerely apologizing for the difficulties uh, he has caused. He said if he had to do it over again, he probably wouldn't do it. That seems fairly logical now, doesn't it, Chris? <laughs> Yeah, hindsight is twenty twenty, and I guess uh, the payday does not overcome jail time or whatever trouble he's going to end up being in. Right. I mean, it's kind of interesting uh, what this guy says, and I, I think if we had spent time in jail, we would regret having done what landed us in jail. Uh, this, <laughs> this is a direct quote. After more than 400 days in jail, I've had a lot of time to reflect. Well, yeah, uh, you've had a lot of time to reflect, and probably you shouldn't be breaking the law and ending up in jail. You should have been extradited uh, if you have committed what is a crime, helping a, a fugitive flee from justice. So I don't have a lot of sympathy for that. Uh, what is odd about this story, of course, is Ghosn is apparently free and clear living in uh, Lebanon, where he ha holds a passport. He holds citizenship there. Others are being charged and potentially could go to jail or could go to prison. Uh, based on his nefarious deeds. Yeah, it's hard to advocate for a criminal, but it's, it's. Uh, <laughs> I guess it's, I, the funny is the word, I guess, that comes to mind that the person who actually committed the, the deeds is walking free of the people who helped him are now suffering the consequences. So hopefully some, some resolution comes of it because the guy continues to, to surface here and there in the news and in, and in books everywhere. So uh, hopefully there's a resolution for the people involved. Here is, uh, yes, and I agree with you there. And uh, <laughs> this is one little tip. If you're going to uh, break the law, probably you shouldn't give an interview to a, a major magazine because uh, he, Michael Taylor, hasn't denied his involvement in the escape. And he described how he did it in an interview with Vanity Fair. So, you know, maybe just a little tip, pro tip. <laughs> don't admit what you've done uh, criminally uh, in a major national magazine. Yeah, I didn't know that. That's actually, uh, that, that makes it worse. <laughs> yeah, so I don't know whether that qualifies him for the America's Dumbest Criminals or, or close, but uh, maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. Well, when we come back, it will be road test time, and uh, we will be talking about two trucks, uh, both with off-road potential, the uh, 2021 GMC Sierra uh, 1500 AT4, and the 2021 Toyota Tacoma. So stay with us for that. With Chris Teague, this is Jack Nerad with you, and you're listening to America on the Road. Welcome back, everybody, to America on the Road with Chris Teague, Jack Nerad with you, and it is road test time on America on the Road. We love road testing vehicles. We love talking about them for you and uh, maybe helping you understand them a little better. Maybe a lot better. I guess that's the goal. But uh, interesting vehicles this time around. Two pickup trucks uh, of different sizes. 
Chris, tell us a bit about the vehicle you're road testing this week. Absolutely, Jack. I drove the 2021 GMC Sierra uh, 1500 AT4. So this is the light duty pickup truck. It's not a heavy duty pickup truck. Uh, the AT4 package is, as you mentioned a little earlier, an off-road capable package. It adds a lift kit. I think it's two inches. Uh, it's got beefy all-terrain tires. Uh, and the truck just looks great overall. It's got red tow hooks up front. And uh, this particular truck had the Carbon Pro package, which is the carbon bed, which makes it super tough. Um, one of my colleagues here in New England filmed a video with the same truck uh, and a sledgehammer where he actually injured himself but did not hurt the truck. So uh, quite a tough bed in this thing. Uh, the optional engine that this one came with is a 3-liter uh, Duramax turbo diesel. It's an inline 6 it's a 277 horsepower, 460 pound-feet of torque. And I got to say, you know, people sometimes complain about the sound of diesel and how it's a little bit rough. But this one, uh, you start the truck up and you can barely even hear it running under the hood. And I don't know if you've driven uh, either a Silverado or a Sierra with a diesel uh, jack, but I think they've done a really good job with the refinement on this one. They have come a long way. And a, a diesel is a great option, I think, in that kind of vehicle. And uh, I think that's why a lot of people are, are taking it. But both longevity and for fuel economy reasons, of course, you have to weigh in the fact that you're going to pay a, a significant premium for that diesel. But in terms of overall drivability and just having it day to day, I think a diesel in that truck and it, it provides incredible range as well. So there's a lot of good reasons, I think, to, to go with the turbo diesel. Absolutely. It's extremely refined, too, and smooth. So uh, all great all around there with a 10-speed automatic transmission. There was no stumbling of gears. There was no kind of fiddling around trying to find one at low speeds. Everything was very smooth. No issues there at all. What I will say is, you know, I was in, I was tempted to skip over talking about the multi-pro tailgate, but the way I use the truck for the week makes it almost the highlight of the whole experience for me. Uh, we're building a patio in our backyard, and unlike the patio that I built at my old house last year, so two years in a row I get to dig a hole and build a patio, uh, but unlike that patio, we're using 30-pound paver stones, and these are big, heavy, sort of 24-inch by 13 or 14-inch oddly shaped tiles, and you know, I put some cardboard down on the bed of the truck and put an old rug back there to protect it, the, to stack the, the stones in there. But the Carbon Pro bed, I found I really didn't need to do that. I think, you know, there's an extremely tough bed on this thing. The tailgate, the multi-pro tailgate has uh, two or three folding functions. So it's got the main tailgate that folds down and then another smaller section that folds down within that. Uh, and then another step that folds out of that. So you have several different ways you can fold it and configure it to either carry lumber in the back of the truck or to use it as a step, which I did to load these giant, very heavy, awkward pavers into the back. I can't say enough about how convenient this makes the back of the truck. You know, I love the way that Ford does steps in their Super Duty pickups that they fold out and they've got a handle that comes up. But there's, it's really hard to beat the utility that you get from being able to reach further into the bed once the little uh, partition is folded down. And uh, this one had an optional stereo built into the, the multi-pro tailgate, which, you know, for a camping trip or a beach party, I could see being awesome. I didn't get to use it, but uh, definitely looked clever. But, you know, for an off-road pickup truck with a lift kit, this thing ended up being extremely useful for hauling and towing and using, uh, you know, basic truck stuff. So in addition to being just a big beefy, you know, diesel off-road pickup truck, it was extremely useful, just the everyday stuff, which I found to be uh, really nice. Yeah, one of the things I found with the full-size pickup trucks is they are among the, the best riding, uh, most comfortable riding kind of vehicles, depending on how they're configured. You know, some of the some of the 4x4s, maybe not so much, and maybe the AT4 wasn't uh, quite, quite what it might be in terms of around town driving. But in a lot of ways, they function almost like limousines, uh, the way they feel, because with the separate body and frame, there can be a lot of isolation between between the frame and uh, where you're sitting. So that's a good thing. Did you experience that, Chris? I agree. You know, there's enough rubber on these uh, with this package that comes on the wheels. So there's enough rubber to soak up almost anything. And I think the off-road suspension and the lift kit did not ruin that at all. It was very smooth. You know, we have, uh, we're well into summer now, but we still have roads that are torn up by plows. They don't, they, they pave them, you know, once every other year or so. And even on those sort of rutted and broken roads, this it just cruises right over, and it's very quiet inside. Uh, comfortable leather interior. This one had uh, optional ventilated and heated seats and uh, heated steering wheel. Um, did not need the heating functions for this past week. It's been in the 90s for several days now. But um, all around, it's a very comfortable truck. 
at almost $60,000 with options. It's definitely not cheap, but I will tell you that it's one of the first in a long time full size pickup trucks that uh, I would actually pursue buying. I think it's an actual, an excellent uh, option. Ah, well, very, very cool. Well, I have another one that I would put in front of you as uh, perhaps an option for you. It's a, a slightly smaller uh, vehicle. It is a midsize truck, uh, the Toyota Tacoma. In fact, not only is it a midsize truck, it is the best-selling midsize truck, and it has been so for the last 16 years. Uh, there's a lot of reasons for that. Of course, Toyota's uh, quality and reliability are among them. It also has an off-roading bent, if you'd like that. There are off-roading versions of this. One of the things that uh, is a benefit with the to uh, Tacoma, especially because of uh, the number of sales that it makes, is because of the volume, Toyota offers it in uh, an incredible number of flavors, uh, 33 flavors, uh, actually. I, I think there's a 31 flavor. Isn't Baskin-Robbins 31 flavors? Uh, uh, this is 33 flavors, 33 configurations based on its two cab types, which are an access cab and a double cab. It doesn't have a conventional cab anymore, which is probably just as well. Each of those is available in rear drive or 4x4 configurations. And then there are two different wheelbases and different uh, bed lengths and all kinds of different stuff. So you can set up the Tacoma uh, in very different ways. As an off-roader, it was essentially unchallenged in this segment. Uh, until recent vehicles, I think there's an AT4 version of the, uh, the GMC Canyon uh, that might challenge it. And of course, there's the Jeep Gladiator, a midsize pickup truck, of course, uh, in a lot of ways like the Wrangler. So... Uh, that is an off-roader. But if you're looking for a rugged off-roader, I'll tell you the, the Tacoma is a great choice. And we're go soon going to be seeing a new Nissan Frontier. In fact, I'm going on an event to drive the all-new uh, 2022 Nissan Frontier, I think toward the end of July. So that will be interesting. There is a new trim for 2021. It's called the Trail Special Edition. And it has some, some equipment changes that make it suitable for the trail. I would say not for heavy off-road, but for trail stuff. There are some heavy off-road, though, versions of the Tacoma. The TRD Off-Road and TRD Pro among them, probably foremost among them. The TRD Pro is, is four-wheel drive only, for example. And then with all these varieties, uh, the pricing uh, comes in a, in a wide variety as well. You can get a base Tacoma truck for about $28,000, and then you can take it all the way up to, uh, well, the TRD Pro has a base MSRP of $45,000, and you can option it up past that. So uh, interesting takes. What I found interesting, too, is Toyota has uh, kept the 2.7-liter, 159-horsepower four-cylinder engine in the lineup. Uh, in a lot of ways, it gets to be overmatched, I think. The uh, Colorado and Canyon have a 2.5-liter four-cylinder engine that delivers 200 horsepower, so that's significantly better than 160. In, in this instance, though, I think torque rather than horsepower is a thing. Certainly, you're well advised to go to the 3.5-liter V6 in the Tacoma. That offers 278 horsepower, so I would go that direction. Well, what's your take? I, I, I'm rambling here on Tacoma, but what is your take on uh, the mid-sized Tacoma pickup truck? I think it's a very enjoyable truck. You know, I drove one uh, same generation last year, and, and I'm going to tell you how tall I am. At six feet tall, I had the 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 awkward experience of having a, a weird seating position in the, the driver's side. I couldn't quite get my legs and my knees high enough, and the seat was a little bit too low to the floor for me. Other than that, I think that the, to the Tacoma... Um, is a great option. You know, it's great predicted reliability. Uh, there's good aftermarket support for it if you want to go that route. It's capable off-road. Looks nice. Uh, it's got decent standard features. You know, Toyota uh, does hold back a little on the tech until everything, all the the wrinkles are ironed out. But we're going to see a new um, Tundra full-size pickup truck next year, so maybe they'll get around to updating the Tacoma soon. Yeah, I think uh, if there's anything that needs to be changed, it's the interior of the Tacoma. In both the uh, double cab and the access cab form, uh, it's a little cramped, and it's especially cramped in the rear. And, you know, we were just talking about how comfortable the full-size pickup trucks are. Uh, it's kind of a shame that uh, you uh, list this as a five-passenger vehicle, the double cab, 
Uh, but at the same time, I think five adults will find that uh, kind of, well, the three in the back won't be happy. Let's put it that way. So that's, the, I think, the downfall. I think they have, uh, Toyota has largely solved the issues they had with tech. Safety is quite good. And uh, all around, there's a lot of good reasons that the Tacoma remains the top seller. Uh, at the same time, I, I might look at the uh, General Motors twin vehicles, the Canyon and Colorado, uh, and we're excited to see the new Frontier. So uh, some good competition, but certainly there are good reasons that the Tacoma is the best seller in the midsize segment. Totally agree. And when we come back, we're going to be uh, answering some listener questions. We've been studying. Uh, we do what we can to provide you with good answers to, our, to your questions, and we love to get them. So Stay with us with Chris Teague. This is Jack Nerad, and you're listening to America on the Road. Welcome back, everybody, to America on the Road with Chris Teague, Jack Nerad, back with you. And we're so glad you're with us. We really do appreciate you taking time to listen to America on the Road. It means a lot to us, so thanks for doing that. And if you like the show, please pass it along to somebody else you think might like it. We'd love that, too. We'd like to grow, of course, and have more listeners. Uh, so thanks for being with us. And uh, it is listener question time. We like to help people out by answering their questions based on our lengthy experience. We don't even want to tell you how long our experience has been in this auto industry. But uh, we love to take your listener questions. So get them to us. Uh, you can send them to editor at drivingtoday.com. So let's get to a question. And here, here is one. This is from Sam in Des Moines, Iowa. Sam asks, is it a good idea to buy a car during a big sale like they have around the 4th of July? Well, it's very apropos of the time period, isn't it, Chris? What's your take? Yeah, I mean, I, I think I'm going to throw out the caveat or I guess the, the asterisk to all this and say, you know, if you need a car, when you need a car is the best time to buy one. I think that's, that's the biggest thing to say. But around sales, you know, they typically do dis discount models. It might not be on the most desirable model that you want to, that you're, you're looking for. So for instance, you know, you might see the F-150 on sale, but you might not see the F-150 power boost hybrid model on sale or top trims and those sorts of things. Uh, so there are generally some fine print items to be aware of, but for the most part, yeah, I think it could be a good, a good way to get a deal on a car. If you're not super particular about which model or color or style you're driving, um, or if you're uh, interested in an older model, although at this point in time, uh, you know, we're not looking at many 2020s left on the lot. You might be seeing 2021 versus 22 that might give you a good deal. But uh, I think it could be a good time to, to go at it. But just be aware that you're not going to you might not be able to get all the features, the colors and the, the trim level that you're looking for. I agree with you, Chris. And I think there's a lot of good reasons to um, shop during a big sale or a big sale weekend. Certainly, we're going to see a lot of promotion. Because there are some real promotions that can save you real money during these kind of situations. But I think you can't just count on that. Uh, we, we talk about this a lot on the show, but do some research. Uh, spend a little time to determine whether uh, that sale price that seems so eye-popping and is going to drag you down to the dealership is on uh, the model that you want with the equipment you want. You just alluded to that, Chris. I would also say, too, I think it's probably fairly easy to get caught up in the hoopla, uh, a lot going on at a dealership. You know, they're giving out hot dogs and, you know, balloons are everywhere. And it, it seems very festive and everybody's buying a car. Well, I would say you really, to get the best deal, take your time. Do what you want to do and work it in your own time. Don't work it in the dealer's time and don't get caught up in the fact that, boy, I've got to complete this deal in the next hour or so or all these uh, vehicles are going to be sold out. And I think a, a lot of people are going to hear that uh, over the course of the next weekend or so. Yeah, I agree. It's like you said, it's easy to get caught up in the hoopla. And you'll see a lot of the advertisements on TV don't even or in newspapers uh, as well. Don't even uh, mention a, a real discount on the car. They're, you know, customer cash back and discounts on the interest rate. So uh, they're going to get their money one way or the other. So just be aware of that and, and don't don't jump in too quickly. Yeah. On the other hand, I think discounts on interest rates are some of the uh, most consumer-friendly kind of things. If you were going to uh, take a car loan and instead you can get that money uh, essentially for no interest, uh, that could be a, a good savings for you. But again, do the math. Spend some time with it. Don't just uh, dive into the deep end of the pool, in bo both figuratively and literally, uh, <laughs> over this weekend. I was just going to say that was responsible advice. Yes, indeed. Yeah, we are both fathers, so we believe in that. Here's another question. Sean in West Hollywood, California asks, 
I can't decide between a plug-in hybrid or a regular hybrid. What should I do? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, well, Sean, I guess it depends uh, on a couple of big factors. The first that we should talk about is the difference between hybrids and plug-in hybrids. And I'm by far not an expert on electrified vehicles, but I, I think I know the difference here is that uh, hybrid vehicles never have to be plugged in. They they charge their batteries and the battery assists or the motors assist the gas engine and, and running. And if, if at all, the all electric range uh, is very small. So you'd be running on battery power only maybe as you take off from a red light or as you're pulling out of your driveway. Uh, but then a plug-in hybrid, on the other hand, generally has, you know, 20, 30 or so miles of all-electric range uh, that the battery can provide through the, the electric motor. Uh, but it does have to be, as the name suggests, plugged in to be recharged. Uh, if you don't feel like charging it, the, the electric motor and the battery just function like a normal hybrid. Uh, but the benefit to a plug-in hybrid is, you know, as I said, you get that all-electric range. I guess the downside is that if you don't own your own home, you live in an apartment, or if you frequently park in an area that doesn't have chargers nearby, uh, the plug-in hybrid, you might not have an opportunity to recharge it. It's still going to take four or five hours to replenish the battery, even if it's you know a few dozen miles of range that you're, you're adding. And on the other downside, plug-in hybrids are a little bit more expensive, and so you'd have to weigh that into your budget. I think overall, for most people, for in-town driving, a standard hybrid is good enough. Um, saving fuel. So I don't know how you feel about that, Jack, but you know, I, I wouldn't recommend a hybrid over a plug-in hybrid unless there's just that, that model that you have to have. Yeah, interesting. And uh, I think you give a lot of good advice there. I would say it really depends on your use case and what you're going to be doing and what your particular situation is. A lot of people can use a plug-in hybrid essentially kind of as an electric car given what they do day to day, and then they have essentially that lifeboat of uh, a gasoline uh, engine uh, should they run out of battery power. Let's say uh, your commute was 20 miles. You had a plug-in hybrid with, say, 30 to 40 miles of uh, electric-only range, and you could plug in at work and recharge at work during the day while you're working there, assuming people actually still do that, uh, which I think uh, they're beginning to do again and have done some have done throughout the pandemic, of course. Uh, that's a pretty good use case for a plug-in hybrid, and it works for the environment. It, it certainly works uh, for you uh, financially because it's generally cheaper to uh, get miles from electricity than it is from gasoline. And then you have that uh, safety uh, of a, a gasoline engine uh, should you run out of juice. You don't have that at all with a, a regular hybrid. In fact, a regular hybrid typically operates as a gasoline uh, vehicle, virtually all the time with a little bit of electric assist. It's not probably quite as green as a lot of people assume it is. So I would say, again, Sean, I don't know what your situation is. The ability to plug in your plug-in hybrid is, of course, uh, an important one. A lot of people buy plug-in hybrids and then never plug them in, uh, which is, kind of defeats the purpose. And there is a significant premium you pay for plug-in hybrid over a a regular hybrid as well. So you have to figure all that into the equation. It's a complicated question, but I think we've at least uh, pointed out some of the parameters you should take a look at uh, before you uh, pick one or the other. Yeah, that's a good point. You know, the plug-in hybrid battery packs are larger and heavier too. So if you're driving around without having recharged it, you're essentially lugging around all that extra weight. But uh, you made some good points, Jack, and opened my eyes a little bit on the, the commute story. Things here in Maine, uh, up until recently when I started, well, I say recently, the past few years when I started working from home, uh, my commute was 40 or 50 miles a day. So, uh, you know, one way. So I think it's a good point that you bring up. In-town driving would be a, a good way to use it as an EV only if you have a charger. Yeah, that could certainly work. And uh, so we thank uh, our listeners for those questions. And if you have a question, again, reach us here at America on the Road. Uh, Editor at Driving Today is the way to get your question to us. And uh, when we come back, we'll be speaking with Ford's consumer marketing manager, Mark Gruber. I sat down with him uh, in Austin, Texas recently, talking about the exciting new Ford Bronco. Are you excited about the Ford Bronco, Chris? I think it'll be several years before I see one at this pace, but yes, I am excited. <laughs> well, I have driven one, and it is exciting, so we will be talking with uh, Mark Gruber about that when we come back. Uh, with Chris Teague, this is Jack Nered with you, and thanks so much for listening to us on America on the Road. Welcome back, everybody, to America on the Road. Jack Nered back with you, and we have a special guest with us. His name is Mark Gruber. He is the, uh, well, you tell me what you are exactly. 
So I lead our consumer marketing at uh, Ford Motor Company, and specifically I lead our utilities and cars, and most notably right now leading the marketing launch for the Bronco. For the Bronco, yes. Very, very exciting uh, launch. And I would say this is more than a car launch, right? I mean, this is a brand launch. This is a lifestyle launch. Give our listeners a, a sense of the scale of this thing, because I, I've been impressed with the scale of it. Sure. So as you mentioned, this is uh, bigger than just a single vehicle. Uh, Bronco is uh, a vehicle that customers have really been uh, begging almost to to bring back since it went out of production 25 years ago. And we're bringing it back not, not just as a single product. There's actually a family of vehicles. So there'll be three different vehicles, a two-door, first ever four-door, and then the entry, which we call the Bronco Sport. And it's really a looked at more as a sub-brand within Ford, where we're going to have um, you know, a whole family of vehicles. We've got a whole accessory lineup and a lot of unique experiences for the customers as well. Let's talk a bit about the marketing of this thing. I mean, we're, I'm going to talk to others about the actual hardware, which is pretty impressive. And I had the chance to drive it both on-road and off-road now, so I'm speaking from experience. But tell us, uh, you know, the thinking of branding this as Bronco, the importance of making this a sub-brand, Walk us through that, would you? Sure. So, you know, it really gets to our overall Ford strategy, which is about leveraging our strengths and our icons. And so Bronco is a, an iconic product that, you know, really only Ford can do. And uh, it's an opportunity uh, to really compete in a space that we weren't competing in with our with our other vehicles. And, you know, there's there really was a void within our lineup for a more rugged kind of capable utility vehicle that uh, customers can take outdoors for their adventures. And uh, it's a product that, uh, you know, we've been working on a long time to kind of bring back, but also kind of make sure it's uh, fully representative of what a Bronco should be. And um, one of the original strategies of the first Bronco was its code name was GOAT. And that meant goes over any terrain. And so Broncos, if they're going to come back, they need to be a great all-around vehicle, not only off-road, but on-road as well. Right. And this is an all-wheel drive or four-wheel drive brand only. That's correct. Uh, you know, there's another brand, another four-letter brand that mm -hmm. we won't mention, or maybe we will, uh, during the course of the interview, that is noted for this, kind of had the field all to themselves for yep. a long, long time. And you had this in your back pocket, this, this Bronco uh, that right. you know, a lot of people felt warmly about but hadn't been in the marketplace for a long time. So it kind of made sense, didn't it? It did. Uh, so, you know, Bronco was, uh, has got a rich history, as does Ford uh, in this space. Uh, so it first came out in 1965. Uh, Bronco was actually the first American automaker to coin even the term sport utility vehicle uh, back then in the 60s. And... Back before that, Ford made a, a bunch of Jeeps for the for the war effort as well. So we've got a rich history, and then you add to it stuff like the uh, the Raptor on the F-150, and this is a space, again, that we've got a lot of expertise. Uh, but as you mentioned, uh, Jeep has kind of had this market to themselves for the last several decades. And when we talked to the customers, we really found there was a opportunity for Ford to win in this space because the customers didn't feel like there was a lot of innovation in the space. And we felt that there was an opportunity really to, to innovate and lead in this space with a lot of new technology uh, on the product, uh, which you, you know, uh, have an experience uh, to do as well. How important do you think is heritage? I was, I was, I'm old enough, I guess, and I am lucky enough that when I was picking up vehicles back in the day, I picked them up at Bill Strop and Son. Wow. Uh, and, you know, so, they were doing off-road racing right. prep for Ford Motor Company in those days, and I got a chance to see behind the scenes in a lot of that. So tell me a bit about how you're leveraging the heritage of this vehicle. Well, heritage, first and foremost, I'd say is extremely important uh, in this space for this customer, right? That they, they want to know that it has that credibility, that story behind it, and it's not just a, a Johnny-come-lately. So, you know, even from the start of the marketing launch, we tried to re-educate customers on what our heritage and history was and you know it included stuff like you know racing at the Baja 1000 and uh, you know we brought in the granddaughter of Rod Hall who uh, won the Baja 1000 and she drove a new Bronco uh, in the 
you know, Baja 1000 as well. So I think that that connection to the past is something that uh, customers really appreciate. And, um, you know, you, you got to strike the right balance between talking about the past, but yet again, hey, we got a modern, you know, rugged off-road utility that we're introducing. It's, it's true to the original. It's got the spirit of it. You're not going to mistake it for anything but a Bronco, but it's a very modern uh, utility vehicle. Give us, give our listeners some sense of the scale of this thing. I mean, you don't have to quote money figures, and you probably won't. Uh, but this is obviously is a major effort. I mean, launching any vehicle line is an effort uh, and costs a lot of money, and a lot of thinking goes into it. But it, you know, this strikes me as this times ten or times a hundred. I mean, I, what would you, you know, what's your scale for this launch versus others? Yeah, it's, um, you know, because it's, it's massive is the short answer because it's, you know, multiple vehicles. It's a whole sub brand, as you mentioned, you know, there's u- unique displays that many of our dealers were, you know, adding, you know, a whole uh, number of people and investment at the Michigan assembly plant where it's assembled, you know, there's an investment of, uh, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars there it's just it's a massive investment that uh, it takes a long time to introduce one new vehicle let alone a a whole uh, brand of vehicles and then you're doing stuff uh, about educating the consumer which is interesting to me i mean you know i got the sense and i i heard today that you're expecting a lot of these customers won't be off-road won't be off-roaders but they're intrigued by it right so Tell, tell me about that opportunity. That's interesting to me. Sure. So we know from our initial data that there's a lot of new customers. In fact, 75% of the initial orders that we have are new to Ford. And a lot of those are from our competitor, but a lot of them are brand new to this space. And as you mentioned, they're, they're excited to go off-roading, to get in the outdoors, but Quite frankly, they don't really know where to start. They don't know how to do it. And it's a bit intimidating if you're kind of new to the space. Uh, I would say it's probably even the majority of those customers are kind of in that position. And we felt that there was a huge need to kind of help these customers understand, you know, what they need to do to kind of off-road and how to get the most out of their Bronco. So when you purchase a Bronco two or four door included in your price, is the opportunity to go to one of four what we call Bronco off rodeos. The first one's here in Austin, Texas. There'll be three others across the U.S., one in Moab, one outside of Vegas, and one in the Northeast. And there you can learn all about, again, Bronco and how to get started uh, off-roading so they can have that confidence to kind of go out and do that. Well, and I just came from there, literally minutes ago. Right. Uh, I arrived back from there, and I encourage all our listeners to take advantage of that. It is a wonderful experience. I think it, it is also an experience if you had maybe intenders or people in the space right. giving them the opportunity to do this. It would convert them <laughs> to, right. to, into Bronco buyers. So uh, it, it's a kind of an interesting way to go about marketing, I think, uh, this whole yeah, brand. It, it'll be available, as you mentioned, to not only the uh, the owners uh, of the Bronco, and you can even go there before you take delivery, but down the road to prospective customers. And uh, we know, if, you know, once you get in a Bronco and get to experience kind of off-roading, I think you'll be hooked and uh, you'll love it. But it's just uh, we're going to give them a little help to kind of get started. How are you preparing dealers to sell? This is a different customer for them, obviously, too, and mm-hmm. they have to be prepared. And, you know, these are fairly, te- these are quite technical vehicles, actually. Uh, talk a bit about that, would you? Sure. So a big effort there to kind of make sure the uh, the dealerships and the salespeople there are ready to answer all those questions and help these new customers. We have a number of things that we're doing there. We've Within each dealership, we have... Um, a Bronco kind of specialist within each dealership that uh, trains the other um, sales consultants within the dealership. And then we've also had all the dealerships come through that off-rodeo experience that we just mentioned. So they understand what it's all about and they can explain this this great new product and all that it has to offer because, yeah, there's, there's just so much new technology and ability to Everything from how do you take the doors off and the top off to, you know, how do you use the different uh, technology to kind of go off-roading? Yeah, I mean, it's a product that takes some education, right? right? Because 
it, it offers so many opportunities. It's not like you just get in a sedan or you get in a sport utility and you kind of get it and you, and you drive off. And, you know, maybe you don't know how all the uh, stuff works, but you really don't need to know how the inv infotainment system works exactly and off you go. But to get the full experience out of the Bronco, it strikes me there's a lot of education to be done. And there, there, there really is. To your point, on any new car, there's usually a lot of new technology. But when you get in a vehicle like a Bronco, there's just so much that there is to kind of learn on that. And when you take delivery, you're probably just wanting to, to get out and just, you know, get on the road or on the trail with your with your Bronco. So, you know, I think that off rodeo is going to be a great opportunity to for customers to really, you know, spend a day and a half and learn all about the Bronco. Uh, learn everything again from how do you take the doors in the top off, how we use what we call our goat modes and when you use them and even things such as, you know, proper uh, off-roading etiquette and tread lightly principles. Uh, you know, we feel we have a responsibility to kind of teach some of these new folks that are coming into the space about kind of how to do it and how to do it right. Right, right. And, you know, uh, <laughs> make sure that uh, you pack out what you pack in and all of those things. Absolutely. That, uh, you know, uh, change things for you. What, what about this product uh, really excites you? You know, where, where are some things about the product that you go, wow, I can, you know, hang, this is a marketing hook I can hang something on. You know, what are some of those things? So a couple of my favorites. One, uh, the first one that comes to mind is, um, you know, on Bronco, uh, these customers want what we call open air. They want to be able to take the top and the doors off. So on the four door, um, we've just made it super easy to kind of get that open air experience. So for example, on the doors, they don't have a frame around the window. So when you take it off, it's very easy to handle. They've even built in our designers, you know, handles to kind of pick up the door and take it off. Within the door. Within itself. the door. And yeah. the doors are made out of aluminum, so they're lightweight. And then, hey, what do you do with those doors? You would see some of the competitors' doors literally chained around a tree on the, uh, on the trail. And so uh, our engineers designed it so on the four door, you can put all four doors in the cargo area in the back and you can put them even in these bags to kind of keep them protected. And then once you take off the doors, hey, you still got a mirror because it's attached to the vehicle itself rather than the door. So it's just clever engineering like that, that, that I really appreciate. And then one of the other features is what we call our hero switches. And these are the switches like for your front and rear locking axles or your stabilizer bar disconnect. And so we have those located up on the top of the dash. So when you need them, you're not hunting. Where, where are those buttons? They're up on the top of the dash. And then they're all silicone coated. So if they ever get moisture or dirt on them, you don't have to worry about the durability of those because everything's kind of silicone uh, coated for the steering wheel and those hero switches. I mean, it was great just doing the off-road experience that I did this morning. Uh, the learning experience, when, in, uh, when to employ the front locker, when to employ the, fr the rear locker, that kind of stuff, all at your fingertips. Really terrific. I mean, I, I learned a lot over the course of just, you know, that couple of hours. Uh, and I think um, the consumer will enjoy that too. And you mentioned taking the doors off and being totally open air. I intentionally went into those vehicles just to, I mean, it wasn't a cool day today. So right. I, no, was, I was suffering a little <sighs> well, with no air conditioning, but at the same time, I really wanted to get that experience. And the added visibility of being to see out where the door <laughs> would otherwise block you. I mean, that kind of stuff is, is really cool about this vehicle. And it's not something you experience in virtually any other vehicle. No, very, very unique uh, experience in a, in a Bronco. And, you know, we really wanted to make the Bronco easy, um, not only for the novice who's kind of getting into this, but also very rewarding for the experience, kind of the more professional off-roader. And regardless of your skill level, I think you'll really enjoy the Bronco. Absolutely. Absolutely. Set up for our listeners, the Bronco and the Bronco Sport. Bronco Sport obviously available now. Bronco available for order and probably rolling into dealership soon. But give sure. us the high hard ones about that stuff. Sure. So we have three members of the Bronco family. There's the Bronco uh, two and four door. These are larger size, similar in size to the to the Jeep Wrangler. 
We have 125,000 orders uh, right now for the Bronco two and four door, but you can still uh, get your place in line. You can put a, a reservation or an order in um, uh, with your dealer. And those vehicles, we're excited. They're, they're already coming off the line and they're arriving at dealerships right now. So the very first customers are, are taking delivery as we speak. And then we also have the Bronco Sport, which is a little bit smaller, um, a little bit more affordable version of the, uh, the Bronco. We like to call it the Bronco of small SUVs. So it's more like an escape size, but extremely capable off-road. And those uh, are at dealerships uh, now and on sale. Um, so you can you know, go into a dealership right now and, and find some of those Bronco Sports. Uh, the bigger Bronco starts about $30,000 and goes up to $60,000. And the, the smaller Bronco Sport starts around $25,000 and goes up to about $40,000. Describe the difference in the customer between Bronco Sport and Bronco, because I, I think that's kind of interesting. Sure. So for the uh, Bronco Sport, we like to try to uh, summarize that by saying that's a customer that often needs a rugged utility vehicle with a lot of room for their cargo and their gear and they need a vehicle to kind of take them to the trailhead or wherever their adventure starts and then the bronco two and four door that's kind of the ultimate uh expression of bronco right you can take the doors and the top off and you know there you can go to the trailhead and far far beyond customers will do some overlanding with the bigger bronco but that's a vehicle that you know, really the sky is the limit in terms of the capability of what uh, what you can do in the Bronco. Um, but uh, a little bit bigger vehicle, uh, a little bit higher level capability on, on the bigger Bronco. Well, it sounds like we're going to have a lot more new off-roaders out there in Broncos in that brand. Mark Gruber, thanks so much for being with us. We really do appreciate your insights on this. Thank you, Jack. It's been a pleasure. And stay with us, everybody. We'll be right back right here on America on the Road. And that was our interview with Ford's Mark Gruber talking about the exciting Ford Bronco. I had a chance to drive that and you know, a blast doing it. Um, amazing abilities off-road. So uh, look for that launch coming your way. Uh, hard, going to be hard to avoid it. Uh, one person we always like having with us, we don't try to avoid him, is Chris Teague. Chris, thanks so much for being with us again as our co-host. We appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me, and thanks everyone for listening. I will say, as I always do, if you like what you heard and you want to hear more, please hit like and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. If you have a moment, go ahead and leave us a review as well. That will help us continue to grow and bring more people along for the ride. Well said, Chris. Uh, we love having you with us. Please pass our show along to others. If you would, if you like it, and think other people would like it, uh, please put it in front of them. Uh, I'd also like to put in front of you the GR Factor, Unleashing the Undeniable Power of the Golden Rule. That's uh, my most recent book. Look for that at bookstores around the globe. You can find it at Amazon or Barnes & Noble, a bunch of different places. So uh, check that out if you would. And again, thanks to Chris Teague for being with us. Thanks to Mercury Insurance for helping to sponsor the show. And uh, by all means, thanks to you for listening. We do appreciate it more than anything. So uh, thanks for being with us. And join us again next time for another edition of America on the Road. America on the Road is brought to you by Mercury Insurance and DrivingToday.com. If you're looking to save some money, you should switch to Mercury for your auto and home insurance. Californians save an average of $670 with Mercury, so imagine how much you could save. Get a quote today at mercuryinsurance.com. If you're looking for auto information that can save you some money, go to drivingtoday.com, the home of America on the road.